Most of us that have a few years on us have some scars that Samantha was talking about. We grew up in the time that kids rode bikes without helmets. Uh, we didn't wear elbow pads, knee pads. We weren't bubble wrapped uh, like a lot of kids are today. And so we developed a few scars. I think we could all probably show our scars today. I, I heard a few about Adam jumping off the porch and getting a good scar there. And uh, most of you could talk about some of the scars. And uh, some of us, you know, there were accidents. Some of us were bullied. Uh, I was uh, hit by a rock right in one of my eyebrows here. You can still see the scar uh, with it. Uh, but a kid threw a rock and hit me, and he would have gotten in big trouble if I hadn't have threw the rock first. Uh, but uh, I missed. He didn't. Uh, he was a much better rock thrower than I was. Uh, but uh, his landed, and it caused a pretty good scar there. I've got uh, different scars. Um, but the truth is, uh, most of us have those kind of physical scars. But there's also emotional scars, spiritual scars, that may not show on the surface always, but they're there. There are scars from our past of traumas and uh, things that have happened in our life, in our childhood, or sometime in our life, in relationships. There are traumas that cause scars and wounds within us. And they're just as real and some oftentimes uh, very, uh, very hard to heal, uh, but they can. And so when I think about a story about scars, I think about Joseph. Joseph was a person who no doubt had some significant emotional scars. And just think about him for a moment. You know, as a young man, he was one of the favorites of the family, it seemed like, you know, as parents, we, we shouldn't play favorites. We don't like to, hopefully, but sometimes it happens. And Joseph was sort of a favorite. He was uh, kind of pampered in ways that the other boys were not. And one day Joseph has a dream, and in this dream he, uh, he dreams that he is exalted above his other brothers, which is a true story that actually does come true. But he, had, uh, he didn't have enough wisdom at that point to keep it to himself, and he shared that with his brothers. And you know, not everyone is happy about our successes. And they were not. And they felt like he was uh, kind of getting too big for his britches. And uh, they did a really nice thing. They took him out and threw him in a well. And when that didn't work, they sold him into slavery. And, you know, that could have been the end for Joseph. And he could have laid there and, and, uh, in his wounds. And, but, but, you know, the story doesn't end there, does it? The story goes on. And... Uh, there was a, a young lady who took a liking, which was uh, you know, Potiphar's wife, and uh, tried to have uh, relations with, with Joseph. But Joseph took the moral high ground, and, and, uh, and he fled. But as a result, she was scorned, and she accused him falsely of rape. That happens. You know, it does happen. Uh, I think it, it, it should tell us that, that we t need to take every story serious, but uh, not just to take it at face value. We got we to gotta find out the truth. Well, anyway, Joseph is thrown into prison. Falsely accused, thrown into prison. Think about now at this point in his life. Think about the emotional scars. He's been disowned by his own family, his brothers, his very brothers. I mean, that's, that can be very hurtful. You know, it's, it's one thing to be uh, rejected uh, by people that may not like you, but when it's your own family, that's doubly hurt, you know. And I think about Jesus. He came into his own, and his own received him not. And so he's been emotionally scarred by the rejection of his family, and then he's been so sewn into uh, slavery, sewed into slavery. And so here he is in prison. And so at least three emotional 
traumas has happened to him already. And you can imagine the scars that Joseph must have had. And you know, I'm so glad that the story doesn't end there. That the Bible, if it teaches anything at all, it teaches us that our scars do not have to define us. In fact, they can propel us to be greater if we allow them to. I'm saying that the bad things that happen to you do not necessarily have to define you, but can be a source of inspiration and greatness for God, to show God's greatness and God's love. I believe that God comes alongside us and helps to heal our wounds. You know, when I read that story in Genesis, it sort of reminds you uh, of the of the gospel story, and toward the end, you know the, the beginning of Genesis and the end of Genesis, sort of uh, in the same way. You know, in the beginning, God created everything good. But there was sin, and because of that we fail, and, and there was, uh, you know, this uh, really a spiritual scar. But you know the rest of the story, how the, uh, you know, Jesus comes. But in Joseph's situation, Joseph kind of pictures Jesus and what he did for us. Because here he comes along, and he is emotionally scarred, just as Jesus was beaten and scarred physically. And yet, at the end, God does something great in his life and uses his example to show what good things that God can do to those who let him. Then we think of Jesus who did that very thing. Who were reminded of another person, the Apostle Paul, who said that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Guess where Paul wrote those words? In a jail cell. He was sitting in jail when he wrote those very words. That all things work together for good. Does that mean nothing ever bad will happen? No, it doesn't. But it means that God will take the bad and He will transform it for you and transform you through it to become something greater than you can ever imagine. But we have to be willing and be a willing vessel. Joseph was the kind of person who, uh, who realized that when bad things were happening, there was a greater story going on behind this. That there was something going on behind the scenes. And sometimes we lose sight of that. As we think about scars today, emotional scars, we realize today that about the emotional scars that's happened because of this pandemic. And we know that people, uh, you know, it, it, you look at the statistics and, uh, you know, child abuse, domestic abuse, suicide, all those things have increased during this pandemic. And I, you know, I, I'm convinced, and, and you know, I, I, I think there's people on two sides, two extremes. You've got those on one extreme, it's like, ah, uh, it's not even real. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not even real, and they don't pay a bit of attention. And then the other extremes is people are so petrified by it that they can't live. They can't enjoy life. They cease to be who they want to be. And I, I have to, you know, I think most of us realize that the politicians and the powers that be have taken something that is a bad thing and used it for their political advantages. And they've taken this thing and they've blown it in some ways out of proportion. I mean, I'm not saying it's not real. We, I have a son in the hospital, so I know it's real. And I do believe in wearing masks and all that. But what I'm saying is that people will take bad things and use it for their political advantages to gain their political whatever they want, uh, their stage. But the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I want you to hear this today. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be careful. We should. But what I'm saying is we should not allow the world to put us in a box that where we're so afraid that we can't enjoy our Christian life. 
we have to understand that God is on the throne. And as long as He's on the throne, nothing can happen that He does not allow. Please don't hear me wrong. Don't go out here and say, the pastor said we don't have to wear a mask anymore, and we don't have to be careful. You know, I wear them every day. And we try, and, and that to me is, is just showing that you care about other people. Because even if you don't care about yourself, you care about other people. But at the same time, we can't allow these kind of things to define us and to hold us down. And I think, you know, in, in so many ways, we, under, we need to realize that sometimes we can do more damage by doing those things, shutting down the economy and do all these things, than we do by simply being careful and living our lives. And so as a result, what has happened is you've got a whole lot of people today who have, you know, a whole lot of crime, a whole lot of things going on in our world. And, and we have to be careful that we don't fall into that mindset of, of, you know, woe is me. Here is Joseph thrown into the dungeon of a prison. Here is the Apostle Paul in prison. The Bible says that, that Joseph in prison, while he's in prison, he gets kind of uh, on the good side of the prison guard. And he begins to elevate him to one of the wards of the prison. And while they're in prison, there are some dreams that happen. And, and Joseph becomes an interpreter of dreams. But he also has a dream. And he begins uh, you know, to interpret dreams to realize that there's a great famine about to come on the land. When they find that Joseph is able to interpret this dream, they get him to interpret the dream. And eventually... You know, for a while he's forgotten there in prison, isn't he? Because he said, you know, when you get out of here, remember me. And he's sort of forgotten. Sometimes we feel like God has forgotten us. And we have to ask that question time, or sometimes we, we think that question is, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of my stuff? And again, we go back to Joseph. Where was God when Joseph was in prison? Was God still on the throne? Well, yes, He was. So eventually Joseph interprets this dream for Potiphar, and Potiphar exalts him and gives him one of the highest positions in the land, which would be sort of like prime minister today in charge of all the agriculture and economy. To eventually, there is a, a great famine, and Joseph's own brothers have to go to, uh, to where he is to be able to beg for food. His father sends them there. They have no idea at this time, and the father has no idea that Joseph is still even alive. They had told his father that Joseph had died with a wild animal and even took back his coat that they had put animal blood on. In the days before DNA, you could do that, I guess. And so for, the father thought he was dead. And here he comes. They come to him and stand before him, not realizing at that point that that is the brother that they sold into slavery. And at one point, Joseph asks everyone to leave the room except his brothers. And he begins to weep uncontrollably. He says, I am the brother that you sold into slavery. Powerful moment. And his brothers were terrified, afraid that Joseph was going to take revenge on them finally. But instead of revenge, Joseph has mercy and compassion. And he says, you know what? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. God took a bad thing that you did and turned it around and made something good out of it. And it's, by, it's because of this that I am here that I might save some people. And I can't help but thinking about a time when a man on an old rugged cross hung between the heavens and the earth, and the world put him on that cross, but he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And Jesus hung between the heavens and the earth for you and for me. And the story, thank God, doesn't end. And if you go on and read the rest of the Bible, guess what? We don't all die from a pandemic. 
We don't all, uh, we're not destroyed by a comet, but Jesus is coming back someday. And the church is going to be victorious. And you may have some scars. I, I've said it before, uh, uh, you know, I've, the book, the, uh, the Wounded Healer, I, I, I feel sometimes like I am a wounded healer. But you know, when the wounds are fresh and they're still bleeding, you can't do a lot of ministry. But once those wounds begin to heal and you allow them to heal, and listen, I've had many wounds from my childhood of living with an abusive father, and I've had relationships where there was emotional uh, wounds. You know, and, and sometimes people would be emotional, emotionally abusive, and you know, that can happen to women and men, by the way. And it's kind of like what I call emotional vampires, people that drain your very soul and your life from you. And here's the thing. We can lay down and we can say, you know what, woe is me, like a lot of people we see today. You know, I, I was born this way. I was just, I just, I, I can't help it. You know, people were in my past uh, have been mean to me. So I'm just going to, I'm just, you know, everybody owes me something. Or we could do just the opposite. And we could say, I'm not going to allow my wounds to keep me down and to keep me from being what God wants me to be. In fact, Paul said that I, I found out that when I am weak, then I am I strong. And I went to the Lord three times and said, remove this thorn in the flesh from me. And he said, no. He said, what I have found is that, that my weakness has become a source of my strength. That God has taken the very thing that kind of I thought would be the thing that kept me from being what God wanted me to be and use that in order to propel me on the ministry and to keep me humble. And so today, your scars don't have to keep you down, but they can be a source of strength. And I believe that you can be a better Christian, you can be a better parent, you can be a better uh, student, whatever, if you allow God to work in your life. Now listen, I went through counseling and I've gone through a lot of things and I've done a, I've done a lot of reflection and reading of the Scripture and praying and all that is needed. You know, I didn't just wake up one day and said, okay, I'm over that. You know, if you have a trauma in your life, it takes time to get over that. You think about people who come back from the war and, you know, how we are learning more and more about, you know, their post-traumatic stress disorder and how that they need time and they need counseling and they need support as much as they can possibly get. And we need each other in these times. And we need the church. And so there are times that we can just come to the church and, 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 uh, and have that sweet hour of prayer and allow God to heal our wounds. So what are your emotional scars today or your spiritual scars? Your psychological scars. What are those things today that have scarred you? If you've been around very long at all, you probably have a few of those. I'm going to encourage you today to take those very wounds. Some of you may be still, the wounds may still be fresh. And they're still, they're still open wounds and they haven't healed yet. But as we were reminded today, allow God to heal those. And, and as Samantha was saying, once a scar comes over that wound, it becomes stronger. When a bone begins to heal, it becomes stronger than it was before. And God can do that. I can do all things through Christ with strengtheneth me. Listen to me. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I hope you believe that today. I hope you believe that today because I believe it's true and the Bible doesn't lie. So today, take your, take your wounds, take your scars to Jesus. So as we think about that, we come to the part in our service where we, th we, we think about what Jesus did for us. And Jesus... If you think, you know, a lot of us, you know, there's people today that, that want to remove their scars. There's cosmetic surgery and people pay thousands of dollars. And I understand that. I understand that. But, you know, Joseph stood before his brothers and said, these scars, and showed them the scars. These are the scars that were left on me when you threw me into the wild beast in the well. 
Jesus stood before the disciples and said, See my scars. See the scars on my hands and the scars on my side where they put the spear in me. These scars were beautiful. And I, I remember a story, prob probably not a true story, but it's a beautiful story that you may have heard about. Uh, a little boy one time who, when he was a very young baby, he was in, there was a fire, and uh, during the fire, his, uh, his mother saved him, but she, uh, because of that, was burned very significantly and had a lot of scars. And that young man began to, as a young boy, began to uh, grow up, and he knew his mother had scars. He had heard a little bit about the story, but didn't really understand it. But all he knew was that people made fun of his mother, and he was sort of embarrassed to be around her because she had so many scars. And one day they were making fun, and he ran to his mother, and he said, "Tell me, why, why are people so mean, and why, why do you have so many scars?" And, and she explained to him, it was these scars because when, you, when the house was burning that I had literally saved you. And it caused me all of these scars. And the little boy looked up at her and said, you know what, their scars are not ugly to me. They're beautiful. And when I think about the scars that Jesus took for us, I think it's a beautiful thing. The cross has become, which was once a source of shame, has become a source of inspiration for the Christian, hasn't it? And I hope that you can see your scars not as something ugly, but I want you to see them as something beautiful. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion He understood. Think about the fact that all you ever had was misunderstanding and all the things that you brought to God. He turned them around and made something beautiful with your life. He did it for me. And some people would say, you know what? I, I don't want to be with this person. I don't want to hear a preacher who's got scars like that. But you know what? I'm in good company because Jesus has a few too. As we think about the communion service, and I hope the litany should be up there on, with us. We think about the scars that Jesus had for us.